So we have a very interesting topic to discuss today. We're going to be talking all about uh, security. It's a major issue right now, not just you know for organizations and companies. It's across the news. This has become a major thing that a lot of people are talking about. Uh, so one of the, the biggest areas where there's uh, problems on the Internet in terms of security is with your content management system. So we're going to talk about that today, dig in depth to why these things happen and you know what you can do to, uh, to avoid it happening to you. Uh, so let me just go back to my PowerPoint here. Here we go. So today's agenda. Uh, first off, I'm going to introduce who I am. Anyone who's been on the webinar before, or you already know who I am, obviously. I will dig into that in a second. We're going to talk a little bit about the overview of what our topic is today. We're going to talk about why you get hacked, um, which is going to be kind of interesting. There's two different types of approaches. Uh, we're going to talk about the types of attacks, you know, how these things happen. Um, we're going to talk about how if you have an open source CMS today, how you can secure it. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a more uh, secure type of architecture, something that we've talked about before. To give you a preview, it, it uh, is decoupled. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to go into uh, a Q&A from there. So uh, who am I? My name is Peter Check. I'm the CEO of the New Possibilities Group. Uh, Co-founded the company back in 2001. Our background, my background rather, is custom web development, UI, UX design. If you ever need to get me, that's my email address. Uh, what we do, uh, we're the experts in development of safe, secure, custom content management systems. Uh, so we focus on custom web development and design to create websites and applications uh, for customers, clients with complex requirements. Uh, and that's basically what we, uh, what we specialize in. The more complex, the better. Uh, we try to take complex problems and, and solve them with uh, unique solutions tailored for, for each individual uh, you know, customer. Uh, our experience, these are just a couple of the companies that we work with. We've launched hundreds and hundreds of websites over, over 16 years. Uh, this is just a small preview of some name, names that you might know. Worked with a lot of smaller companies, obviously, small to mid-sized, but many, uh, many enterprise customers as well. Uh, who are you? Well, you're here probably because of one of these reasons. Uh, maybe in the past you've had some security issues with your website. Uh, maybe you're about to undergo a design and development project, uh, or maybe you are in the middle of one right now. Uh, maybe you're concerned about potential vulnerabilities for the CMS that you have today. Uh, and you're probably interested in some quick and effective ways to secure your website. So no matter who you are, thanks for being here. Um, we have quite a lot to go through. I think I had 56 slides here today, so I'm going to try to, uh, to get through them as quickly as possible. Um, also, on the right side of the go to control panel, uh, you can put in questions. So feel free to ask questions as I go. Happy to answer them. I will have a time for Q&A at the end. But if you queue up your questions early, that would help me pick and choose uh, which ones we're going to answer. Uh, so let's talk about website security and why it's so important. Um, the first thing is, you know, a lackadaisical approach to security can really make or break your company's reputation. Um, it's very difficult to recover when your website is, is breached from a security perspective. Um, worse than credibility and reputation, you, know, you also have a liability. There's an economic liability. Uh, which we're going to tell you an example of something that happened to Yahoo in a, in a little bit. Uh, so, not a, again, you have to worry about how you look, how people perceive your organization, but also you have to worry about what's the liability if your website gets hacked and, and valuable data is leaked. And don't forget from a personal perspective, if you're a marketer, a CMO, or an IT professional, you know, a security breach, I hate to say it, it kind of means your job, it means your, your butt's on the line. Uh, so ultimately, somebody at an organization is going to be responsible for this, and if you're the person picking and choosing what your future platform is going to be, uh, you know you really have to take it seriously. Um, every time I talk to potential customers, they say hey, security matters; it matters, but it's like fourth or fifth on the list. You know, this year, 2017, it really needs to be number one on your on your list of concerns. Flexibility in any platform is important, uh, but security has to be the number one uh, concern. Uh, so let me just break up break down some recent news. You know, some things that have happened. You know, here's Rudy Giuliani, you know, America's mayor, the mayor of uh, New York City over here, which is about 10 miles to my, uh, to my right, to my east. Uh, he had a really bad January. He uh, was appointed to be the cybersecurity advisor to the new administration, and instantly the Internet did what it did. It went and it vetted him to see, hey, does he actually know what he's talking about? And what did they find out? They found out that his websites, two of them, I think it was GiulianiSecurity.com, and then he had another one. Uh, they were both completely out of date. They were running on Joomla from about four or five years ago. Uh, so bad were they that he actually just took them down, and the sites are gone. If you go to GiulianiSecurity.com today, it just brings up a DNS error. So obviously it doesn't look good. You know, We don't feel that he's credible on the subject uh, when something like that happens, when news happens. He is obviously someone who's well-known. 
he will recover from this. Um, but for companies that are you know staking their claim on security or things like that, if he was any other cybersecurity company, I, they would be toast. Uh, so this is one example. Unfortunately, I have there's too many political examples, but it just happens to be the hot topic right now. So uh, so that's the first uh, example. Yahoo. This is something that happened. Uh, they're obviously looking through going through an acquisition. Uh, they lost three hundred and fifty million dollars of value uh, based on the fact that they exposed one billion accounts uh, with a via a vulnerability. Uh, so this is a huge, uh, you know, huge price to pay, which is going to affect every single shareholder. So there is definitely, you know, this is an example of a a liability in terms of uh, finances. Uh, Three hundred fifty million dollars is quite a lot. And again, I hate to get into politics. I'm going to try to stay agnostic from it. Um, but this is something that's been huge. You know, John Podesta, his emails were uh, were stolen from a Gmail account, which is, you know, inherently a very a relatively secure system. Uh, but he had a weak password. And there was a brute force attack. I believe that's what it was. And those emails got leaked all over. And we all know how that may or may not have affected the ultimate outcome of, uh, of the election last year. So, you know, Internet security affects us in all different ways. It affects not just your personal finances, if you have those passwords get out there, uh, you know, but it affects what's happening globally. And this is a story that's going to become more and more uh, prevalent. You're going to hear about it on a regular basis. And I'm going to talk even about a, a major WordPress hack that just happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're going to get to that. So we're talking about the CMS here. The CMS is a very logical place for hackers to go after. It has a lot of moving parts. Uh, I'm going to focus the conversation today more on open source content management systems. Obviously, a lot of these types of vulnerabilities exist with the closed sourced or the licensed models as well. Um, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on this just for the purposes of this conversation. Uh, so open source CMSs are just what I said. They're open. Communities get together. They work on the code for these. They share the code. The code is there for everybody to see. That means it's open, accessible, and as the community goes and makes changes, they push it out and distribute it as new versions of the software. So the larger the install base, the more it seems to me that these things become targets simply because there's so many out there. And we're going to talk about the types of hacks that are automated, just looking for popular platforms in a little bit. Um, because it's open source, the accountability it's a little bit more it's a little bit more minimal versus something that's licensed or enterprise. Uh, there's no one person you can really go after. The accountability really falls on you or the person that you hire uh, to go ahead and, and secure the website. And that's always something to uh, remember. And the real issue with these systems is the extensibility. Um, everybody says, hey, these platforms are great because they allow for plugins and extensions and modules and every different application has its own you know, vernacular for that. But those modules oftentimes aren't being vetted by the community that puts out the platform. So therefore, there could be gaps in the plugin or gaps in a theme that you know were never looked at by the core team for WordPress or Drupal or Magento or any of these platforms. Uh, and that in, in that area is where uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that people have to worry about. Uh, so on one end, it's a great thing. You can make your website do anything very quickly by installing the software, but you really don't know what's under the hood. So let's talk about why your, your website might get hacked. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure many of you have had this happen to you. Uh, there's two main ways. Number one, people are targeting you. It's a deliberate attack. And number two is more of an automated type of an attack where people are looking for vulnerabilities uh, for a variety of nefarious reasons. So let's get into deliberate attacks first. These things are the worst. They make you feel the worst. You know you're a target. You're super paranoid. It's a violation. <laughs> it's just pretty much, it, it, nothing feels worse than, than when this happens to you. Uh, the types of attacks that people uh, use, you know, I know we'll go into each one of these in a little bit. You know, brute force trying to steal your password, denial of service trying to take you offline, uh, SQL injections or cross-site scripting. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that they can do this. And the purpose is typically to deface the website, to embarrass you, or to take you offline. Uh, that's typically why these things would happen in a deliberate fashion. Now, automated attacks, uh, these are focused on vulnerabilities within software, and it's automated machines that are going to try to do it. Uh, so this is very common with open source software. I'd say this is the vast majority of hacks that happen. Most of the time when we onboard people, new clients, and they come and they say that their site has been hacked, usually it's something such as this. Uh, typically, a goal is to inject something that has a purpose. Uh, so it might be malware. Uh, and the purpose of putting malware on a, on a machine, well, there's a couple of reasons. First is maybe just to propagate itself. Uh, there's a really great documentary out there about the United States intelligence uh, 
and Israeli intelligence, we actually created malware that got introduced to computers all around the world, and we were looking very specifically for one set of computers, and it was in the centrifuges, or it was in the, the uh, where they keep, I mean, I'm not a nuclear scientist, obviously, but where they keep the centrifuges in Iran was the target. So millions and millions of computers all around the world were getting affected by this software, and the software specifically was looking for a particular model of a centrifuge motor made by Siemens, and when they found it, it was going to infect the motors, causing them to go into overdrive and burn them out. So your local computer might have been infected by this malware with that particular purpose. So that's, that's one reason why this software gets out there and propagates. Another reason is to distribute bulk email. This is getting a little bit less prevalent, uh, but a lot of times software will get installed on your server, flood your mail queue. Next thing you know, you get an email from your, from your host saying, hey, why are you sending tens of thousands of emails and we're going to take you offline? That's typically, it's going to happen through a malware, uh, you know, infection. Uh, and one other thing that used to happen, but it happens a lot less now, is Black Hat SEO, where these scripts will go out, install links on your site, trying to build up the backlinks to a particular website. Google's pretty good now about avoiding these, uh, these types of things. So uh, we don't see that as much, but that's a reason why it used to happen. So what exactly does happen? Here's a great example. Uh, here is an example of some code that was appended by, uh, via a malware script. It actually went into a uh, installation of a CMS and started appending this code. This particular code here is, I believe, just appending a link uh, and uh, to a particular site. Um, this happens all the time. This is extremely common. Uh, what will happen to you? Well, if they know that there's malware on your site, when you, users go to Google, do a search for you, they might, or if they're using Chrome, they might actually get a warning like this. And this is death. This is the worst possible thing that can happen to you. If this warning goes up, it's going to be difficult to get rid of it. It's going to affect your SEO. You could spend years and tens of thousands of dollars making your site rank organically well, and something like this will absolutely kill you. Very, very bad thing. Uh, and this happens all the time. Here's a defacing attack. Uh, this actually, and again, back to politics, but politicians are, are very good targets for people. Um, this is Donald Trump's personal uh, fundraising website. This got hacked a couple of weeks ago. And again, the packer went and made a political message. You know, so these are the types of things that happen. Uh, I've seen this happen to sites where they were you know, not necessarily a known target, but a person found that they could get in and they put up a message like this as well. So let's talk a little bit quickly about the types of attacks, uh, you know, what specifically these things mean. So we're going to start with a distributed denial of service, uh, which is also known as a DDoS. Uh, this is something where it's typically aimed at you in particular. And what happens is thousands of computers around the world all start to target and focus on one destination with the goal of taking you offline. Uh, so this is an actual attack map, and I forget what it was. It was towards a company in the United States, but you can see all these different, all this inbound traffic coming from all around the world with the express purpose of taking them offline. Uh, these are very difficult to fend off if you're not prepared. Uh, luckily, there are providers, and I'm going to try to give you a little bit of quick defensive tips for each one of these, by the way. Um, but there are providers such as Cloudflare that actually can work to mitigate this, uh, this level of risk and the price point on these things are like $20 a month. It starts at $20 a month and it can effect effectively uh, you know, mitigate the risk. So DDoS is something that we see. Typically, again, it's, it's aimed at somebody in particular. Uh, but another thing you have to keep in mind is if your hosting environment is hit by DDoS, let's say you're using a shared hosting environment or something similar to that, you have another server or another company is in the same network and they're getting hit, that can take you down as well. So there's definitely a little bit of, uh, you know, secondary uh, casualties with something like this. Um, so you, you always have to be careful make sure that you're hosting in the right place. We have a little bit of separation from everybody else. Uh, so SQL injection is very interesting. If you have a simple login form or, or form entry on your site, um, an astute hacker could actually try to inject SQL code into the form causing it to do all sorts of other nasty things. Now, for at a top level, you know, your database is probably going to handle SQL code. Uh, SQL is the language, structured query language, that powers your database. So in this case, in this example, the guy actually puts SQL code into the username box, and it's actually telling the database to destroy a table of data. Now, it takes a little bit of guessing, um, but you know, let's say you're using WordPress or Drupal, and you didn't change your default tables 
in the database and someone finds a way in, they could destroy or steal or do any number of things with your database just by doing a SQL injection. Uh, so it can affect the web page output, it can give access information. This is a really dangerous thing. The best defense, well, first off, with something off the shelf like a WordPress, change your, your root table name. Instead of having WP underscore whatever, change the naming convention. That'll make it, uh, that'll actually significantly mitigate your risk. And the other thing, just have proper coding and development techniques. Uh, you know, make sure that you look for this sort of thing. Make sure that when you have a username field, you don't allow these weird characters in there. You know, this is kind of like development 101, but a lot of people don't think about it, unfortunately, a lot of developers. Uh, another thing, if you have a database with important information or a table with important information, don't store it in the same place as your CMS. Try to decouple at least that so that if, God forbid, you are hacked, you know, they're not going to get access to it. Uh, so these are relatively simple things. Um, Cross-site scripting, very similar to SQL injection. It also uses typically forms or the query string on a website. But in this case, they can actually inject malicious code into your site, uh, into the front-end experience. So they could put malicious JavaScript and access your cookie data. Uh, if someone were to access cookie data, they could then figure out how to pretend to be you on a particular website. Uh, again, how do you prevent this? You know, just be on the lookout. Uh, have proper coding and development techniques. That's going to help you. Make sure that you don't accept these weird characters and these weird inputs into query strings or forms. It's actually relatively simple. Uh, brute force attacks. You can get software and you can download this on your computer that will attempt to log in over and over and over again uh, to a variety of different services. Happens all the time. Uh, it targets login areas, so they'll try for a username they might know. Maybe somebody who kind of did research on a target and they know the person's email, they might try to log in over and over again. Uh, there's a couple of ways, and the, by the way, this is trial and error, obviously. Uh, you can definitely fend this off with a couple of development techniques. You can have login limits. You can lock people after five failed attempts. This probably happens to you guys with your banks all the time. You can do two-factor authentication. This should be kind of like a no-brainer. It shouldn't be a possibility that someone can log in over and over and over again to try to guess a password. Uh, and also, at the worst, or at the you know, the first thing you can do as a user is have a password that actually is significantly, uh, you know, complex. So it has characters, it has numbers, letters, uppercase, lowercase. Try to make it as complex as possible. Uh, and then with automated attacks, actually, I already had this slide. We're going to skip this one because I already basically talked about it. But again, they they focus on known vulnerabilities. This is most common with open source software. Actually, this slide is different. It's a little bit different. Um, the goal, again, is to propagate itself. So what do you do in terms of this? This is where you keep your CMS up to date. You know, you keep the software up to date. You prevent these injections from coming in. Uh, you not just make sure your core CMS is up to date, but you make sure the plugins and the themes are as well. Again, those are areas where these automated attacks are really going to, you know, try to focus. Uh, so a couple of things I've seen, this is just from my personal experience. Uh, in one case, we had a vulnerable WordPress install. I onboarded a new customer. I'm home at Friday night. I have nothing to do, which I shouldn't admit, but it, it's the truth. And I log in to check out their WordPress install. They hadn't logged in in a couple of months. The minute I went in and tried to edit a page, every single file in their WordPress install got appended with the malicious code. It was waiting for a trigger, and I triggered it. So this is something that we had actually seen. Uh, another thing that was interesting, we actually saw someone whose office computers got infected with a worm. It was looking for FTP credentials, and once it found them, it would log into those sites and then change every HTML and PHP file, which is fascinating. Uh, it happened to one of our customers, and that was, again, these things always happen on a weekend. It was a very long night where we had to manually go in and restore files or edit files to get the malware out. Uh, that was a major, well, that was an interesting week. Um, another one, uh, viruses that compromise databases and try to actually dump out all the user data. Uh, this actually happens. Uh, you know, when you're coding a website, you always make sure you encrypt as much of that data as possible, especially passwords. It's, uh, it's unbelievable how, uh, how often this sort of thing comes up. And then there was the nice hacker, this guy who actually broke into a client computer, didn't do anything malicious, but left a note to say, hey, I was here, and maybe you should do this and that. And it actually happened a very long time ago, but I remember uh, going into a client account and seeing a note and being like, oh, man, that, you know, that, that hurts. And that was one where it wasn't, again, it wasn't malicious, but it was targeted. The guy was after, uh, was after this person in particular, this client. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about platforms. You know, some are obviously worse than others. On the open source 
front, WordPress and Joomla just seem to be the absolute worst. Drupal is a little bit better. The larger the install base, the larger the risk because they're going to be bigger targets. WordPress right now I think has 6,000 plus vulnerabilities that we know about. It's actually a pretty astounding number. Uh, now I don't want to pick on WordPress too much, but I am. Uh, because it's the worst offender, I absolutely have to bring it up. Uh, but I also think that I'm going to digress in a minute. I'm going to tell you my thoughts about WordPress. You know, it's getting more and more popular, and this is why we sort of have to nip this in the bud and really look at this and think, you know, is this the right choice for us to make? Uh, so just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and here's an article from the 10th of February in, uh, from the BBC, there was this massive hack that was enabling hackers to come in and deface tens of thousands of websites and WordPress actually no delayed the notification they sent the update out first but didn't say what they were updating uh, they were just telling hosting providers but there were people that were finding it and taking advantage of it uh, so this again tells you how important it is when there is an update to run it um, but it also tells you you know every single time they release it they say oh we fix these problems we fix these fix these problems but there's so many people looking to take advantage of it uh, and again this just happened a couple of weeks ago you know, the, the core problem with WordPress is really just the architecture. Um, it's kind of dated at this point. It's not really built for security. And being a tool trying to solve so many problems for so many people, it has, you know, taken on these layers of risk. The more you try to do, the more software you need, the more the code you need, the more holes and gaps you're going to introduce. Uh, so one of my biggest problems with it is it's an old methodology. Your display, which is what users use, and your admin, they're so tightly integrated, they use the same code, the same code base, you can't really separate them. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and the other thing about WordPress is just installing it isn't enough. You really have to take extra steps, and I can assure you 90% of people don't know or don't do those extra steps, which is resulting in this just this bubble. And, and this is where I'm going to digress a little bit. And we're going to pick on WordPress just a little bit more. Um, but I really do believe it's kind of like a software bubble at this point. Everybody's using it. And now it's making its way into enterprise environments. Um, because the people that are now making, being the decision makers have been working with it for a while. They know it and they have a comfort level. So they're requesting it more and more and more. Uh, but I assure you that if management really knew what the risk levels were with WordPress, that it would not be happening. Um, it's, when you look at the top 100 sites using WordPress, you know, it's a smaller percentage than when you look at the top, maybe 100,000, because it's near the bottom of that range where everyone's really using it. But it is starting to infect back upwards. Uh, and I think this is dangerous. And one of the things is the, the ease of use of WordPress and how easy it is for people to customize it. It's really introduced these non-qualified developers into the world of web development. Uh, and they're infecting the enterprise area because they might be good salespeople, but they don't necessarily know what to do. So back on our political theme, you know, the liability here to these enterprise organizations is huge. It's just big. Uh, and I think that people have to start thinking about this. Um, you know, also on the lower tier, you have people picking WordPress because it's budget conscious. A lot of people know it. Again, a lot of those non-qualified developers, well, they're cheap too. And these people that save money continue to save money because they don't update it. And you have to continuously keep it up to date or all those risks we just talked about are going to come you know, and, and bite in the butt later. And uh, I just want to give you this little example of what we did. I don't even know how I came up with the idea to do this, but I had an intern do this, help me out. Um, we found a list of the top 500 cybersecurity companies in the United States. Uh, they do security software, hardware, consulting services, uh, you know, some physical firewalls, all sorts of things like that. We found 302, literally 302 of 500 use WordPress as their core. But out of those 302, 297 of them skipped some level of step or, or some, some step in, you know, in their level of security. Uh, and it's just, I, I, I'm at a lack for words. I just don't know what, why that would be. And again, I think that you know, they're not really paying attention. I think everyone cares about security. And then they hear some lip service from people that say, oh, WordPress is very secure because of X, Y, and Z. But they're not taking these extra steps. And these are relatively easy things that you can do. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, just to give you food for thought, and I'm going to get off the WordPress, uh, you know, stop beating it up. Uh, Automatic, this is the company that's really behind the WordPress movement. They have a VIP hosting plan. And basically, this is aimed at enterprise organizations that want to use WordPress, and they need to keep it up to date. They need development support. They need CDN delivery, traffic assurance, and things like that. Look at those prices. Their basic plan is $5,000 a month with a $15,000 setup fee. 
and that's just for a company blog. And when you go up from there to an enterprise site, you're looking at $25,000 per month. So $300,000 a year, $15,000 setup. That's what they're charging to keep their platform secure. And I think everybody has to think about this. This is what they're recommending for a high availability WordPress installation, anywhere from sixty to $300,000 a year. So I'm going to leave the WordPress stuff alone a little bit uh, from here on in. Um, you know, what can you do? You know, if you're choosing a platform now, consider better alternatives. If you're stuck with WordPress or Joomla, start securing it immediately and then continue to manage and monitor it. And I should have also said continue to update it because if you're not updating it, you're going to pay later. <clears throat> so at this point, I want to introduce you to a couple of graphical models that we've made. Uh, I think these are very helpful in kind of understanding uh, how the whole security uh, setup of these platforms works. Uh, so this first model, and it is complex when you look at it at first, but we're going to take it step by step. This first model is going to talk about the classic integrated CMS like a WordPress or a Drupal, and we're going to talk about how it looks when it's insecure versus how it looks when it is secure. I'll just grab a drink here. So we start with your classic integrated CMS. This is what you get off the shelf. So you have your website, your front end experience, and you have your CMS. And these are integrated pieces. They live together. They share a code base. They can't be uncoupled in any easy way. And I know someone's going to comment and say you can decouple WordPress, but the vast, vast, vast majority of people, 99.9% .9 are never going to do that. Uh, so this is how it looks. You have your website. You install WordPress. This is what's going to happen. Now, for these pieces of software to work, they need other tools on the server. So you have your database, you have, which could be SQL Server, MySQL in the case of WordPress or Mongo, there's some common examples. Uh, and then you have a scripting uh, interface or scripting language, which will allow actual uh, logic to be conducted, uh, .NET, PHP, Ruby, you know, Java. Uh, these all operate on a server such as Linux, Windows, uh, you know, Solaris. These are all examples of actual physical server boxes. And in order for it to be served out to a user, they go through a web server like IIS, in the case of Microsoft, or Apache, or these other ones that we've mentioned here. So all CMSs need these tools on the right side of the screen to actually work. Now, here comes your visitors. On the top, you have your little, the blue guys are nice guys. The purple guys are, you know, these aren't good people. Uh, and then you have your little administrators in the green. And they're all coming in and using your website, and they're hitting this one integrated unit. And every time they're operating with this integrated unit, all this stuff on the right side, in fact, let me use my pointer here to see how, all this stuff on the right side is obviously going to be in motion. It's going to be talking to each other. The database is going to be, uh, the scripting language is going to request information from the database. The database is running on the server. Uh, the scripting language is going to script, uh, put it all together, compile it, send it to the web server, and that's going to go to the user just to make things nice and easy. So everything's working to handle all these requests. Uh, the real issue is, you know, you have your happy little visitors and your administrators, but you have these other people trying to get in at the same time. Uh, and they could be, you know, an automated bot. It could be a malicious character like a, an individual. It can also be a, that denial of service attack. It could be a lot of visitors coming at once. Now, when all those visitors come and visit your integrated system, they are going to be exposing all these individual units underneath. So they're going to be able to, obviously the website's going to be using the database and the scripting language, but if it's not set up properly, like I said with cross-site scripting or SQL injections, these nefarious characters can actually get access to a database or access uh, to your scripting language or your web server or the server itself. Now, not only is there that, but if you're not set up correctly, these characters can actually try to infect the individual components. So they could try to break into SQL, they could try to break into PHP or Apache or Linux Core itself. So you have a lot of areas of vulnerability. Uh, this is pretty much what happens when you take WordPress off the shelf. Uh, they have some layers of security and common coding practice to prevent things like cross-site scripting and SQL injections at the core. Again, plugins, you know, you can't always be assured. Um, but off the shelf, it's not going to go and protect individual components from being, you know, maliciously taken advantage of. It doesn't have anything to handle denial of service off the shelf. It's fully integrated. And, you know, these, these guys that get in, they can access all these individual components if they're astute enough to be able to do it. Uh, so let's talk about how you would secure it. So the first thing that you notice is different, this is step one of securing, uh, we've hidden the CMS. It's a little bit darker, so you can't really see it. 
yeah, so many people that use WordPress don't hide the admin path. So what I'm trying to do here is make it more difficult for people to determine the platform that people are on. So we have to hide to a certain extent. That's the first thing I want to do. Uh, the next thing I want to do is install a firewall. Uh, this is that, we talked about this before, Cloudflare can do this. It's $20 a month. There's no reason not to do it. So let's put a layer of protection between the people that are going to be coming in and the, and, and the CMS itself, the entire framework. Now, by hiding it, like we say here, we've made this admin portal more difficult for attackers, attackers to figure out. Look, an astute attacker, they're going to find other ways they're going to dig deeper, but we're making it more difficult. Uh, so we're making it hidden. The administrators are free to find it because they know where it is. But then some of the people that look to do you harm might have a little bit, of, or even your competitors just doing a little bit of research, they're going to have a harder time finding it. Now the next step is to protect your components. So your web server, your server, your scripting, your database. Put those behind firewalls as well. Preventing, let's see if I have it here, hold on. Oh, we're going to have to go to another step. So if we do the firewall, we're going to protect the individual components from the hackers or malicious characters trying to get into each, each individual piece. We only want these things to communicate with each other to the CMS and not be open to the outside world. Very, very important. Uh, so as you can see here, I've added the visitors. We still have the same visitors. But with proper protection, we're going to start bouncing off things like this DDoS. You know, Cloudflare is going to protect that from happening. That's what their services they provide. Uh, so they're going to come and hit that firewall, and they're going to be bounced away. You're going to have a layer of protection. Now, that's still going to have your malicious characters who are going to try to get in. You, you know, they're always going to try. Uh, but what's going to happen is they're going to find it harder to get through to here to all these components because we will have protected it. Also, we've put a little layer around this entire uh, interface here. You know, let's just say that represents proper coding practice and keeping things up to date. So there's no real gaps in this, uh, in this scenario. Uh, the other thing, and I, this is what I talked about before again, and I should probably change the order. I'm going to do that next time. These individual components are not protected from the firewall, so even if the people do get through, you know, we're going to work to make it so that they have a harder time getting, uh, getting deeper into the, into the platform. And here we are again talking about how we've protected those individual components. Uh, so this is what it looks like when your system is integrated off the shelf but properly has been protected. We've taken the individual components and we've said, hey, let's put them behind, uh, you know, put them in safe quarters. Let's make it harder for people to determine who we are. Let's have a layer of protection against, uh, you know, things like denial of service attacks. By keeping up to date, we're going to prevent some of the automated bots from taking advantage of us. And obviously there's some other tricks and, you know, things that we can do as well, uh, which you know, probably go beyond the time I have here today. Uh, but this is what it looks like. So with that said, that's how you have something off the shelf, how you take it from insecure and make it secure. Let's talk a little bit about what a good architecture, the perfect architecture looks like. Uh, and we strongly believe that the best security is via separation. So this means taking the administrative portion of your website and separating it from the front end experience. Uh, this minimizes access points. It minimizes points of failure. Uh, this we believe is the most secure way to actually have a CMS running today. This is a new, it's sort of a new concept, I guess. It's taking, uh, you know, it's getting more popular today, uh, but it is also, you know, goes against the grain of what everyone's been teaching about WordPress and Drupal and all those things for a very long time. So again, on the left side of this model, we see this is what the integrated insecure system looks like, where you have your website, your CMS, and your components. And this is what decoupled looks like. It's a little bit different. You have this unified unit of your CMS, which is still using the same tools, but they're locked away and they're kept away from your front end website, which is communicating through this pipe, uh, which is an API or some other method of con uh, connectivity. So let's just dig a little bit into exactly how this works. So your CMS, again, it's hidden away, locked behind a firewall. Administrators can easily access it. They know where it is. Uh, there's no issue in, in for them to make the changes that they need to make. Oh, let me just go forward. Then we have your website. Your website's living in another environment. I have it here on the cloud just to show that that's one possible way to do it. Uh, it's funny, we talked about S3 earlier in the call and they're having some issues today, but S3 is actually a very good delivery model in terms of security. And uh, kind of ironic saying that today when they're having issues, but it's true. So S3 being cloud-based, uh, you know, let's use that as the example. Your website's on the cloud, your CMS is over here. How do we make them communicate? Well, we can hook it up with an API. That's one way. We can actually publish flat files. You know, that's another way. And there's some other methods that you can use as well. 
But what we've done is we've limited access from the CMS to the front end site. We have one point of access only. This is what decoupling is all about. Let me just go forward here again. So as you can tell here, if the malicious characters, the uh, nefarious characters, I love those words, especially when talking about security, uh, if they're trying to access your, your CMS and your framework, you know, they're going to have a really hard time getting through the firewall. And one of the reasons is they may not even be able to de determine where the CMS lives. You know, we have customers who have the CMS on an internal network that's behind their VPN, you know, their private network, and then they may even turn their CMS off. You, know, you can't do that with WordPress. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to turn the CMS off. I'm going to hide it because they're so integrated. These are things that live together. And the same goes with all these off-the-shelf platforms, whether they're enterprise level or, or open source. Uh, here you can see, again, you're still going to have the problem. There's always going to be the bad actors that are going to be you know, dispersed among your normal traffic. But in this case, again, it's very limited as to where they can go. They can get to the website, they can view it, but they're not going to have any of those avenues or gaps that they would have if the system was was put together. And this is a pretty simple uh, approach. Let me just go back to it. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of moving parts to it. You can utilize on the server side the same exact software. You can use PHP, you can use .NET. Uh, you can use, in, in this case, it could be Windows, it could be uh, Linux. The web server could be Apache, it could be IS. You know, there's a lot of different ways. So you're agnostic with the database. It could be MySQL or Mongo or whatever you prefer. Um, but this layer of protection, you know, this is something that can't be matched by anything that you take off the shelf. It simply can't be done. Um, now, with the caveat there, I am going to say there are plugins now that people are using to attempt to decouple things like WordPress. Um, but again, I'm not sure what the purpose of that is because WordPress is still inherently going to be so insecure. You have to take all those steps to lock it down. There's just not a lot of upside to taking. It's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. And I guess there I am picking on WordPress again. Uh, so a couple of other benefits of uh, decouple. And this is actually the last slide. I was able to talk pretty quick. Um, decoupled, and we have a whole other webinar about this. You know, Take a look at the CMS of the future where I talk about this uh, uh, pretty exhaustively. We talk about, we have a webinar and we have an ebook as well. You know, decoupled systems are front end agnostic. If you look back at the, at the slide, you, know, you can use any technology you want for the front end. And remember, front end technology moves at a much faster rate than back end. So just because the front end technology has changed over the past two years, that should never affect you and your CMS and have to you know, make any changes to your CMS. You shouldn't do it because the front end has changed. So if you have a decoupled system, not only do you have the freedom and flexibility to make your front end interesting and use a decent technology that might be cutting edge, but you'll have a CMS that can actually survive through those iterative changes. Uh, you know, we see off-the-shelf systems continuously changing what they can do to keep up with these technologies on the front end that should be completely agnostic from the back end, yet it, it happens. Uh, the other thing, too, is I mean, I'm going to go back and forth just to use my model. Let's say your website isn't your only delivery method. Let's say you have a mobile app or, you know, feeds going to partners or, you know, OTT devices or things like that. You know, this database really serves at the center of an ecosystem of various things. You know, your display isn't just a website anymore. Um, and that, again, if you look at WordPress, WordPress was built, and I, you know, I'm picking on WordPress too much. Let's pick on Drupal. Let's go that way. Drupal was built for web display. It was not built for all these other devices that are coming out. It's not device agnostic. And that's why the people that control those projects, they're starting to realize that and they're attempting to decouple these systems. But again, the original intent was to have them tightly integrated. So if you're building some sort of application or something complex, and you're going to have more delivery methods than just the web, you know, you absolutely have to consider decoupling. Uh, and as I said before, the lifespan, you know, having a CMS that can last you five, six, seven or more years, uh, you know, running in a separate environment versus the front end, there's a, there's a, you know, economy there, uh, you know, as opposed to over seven years, you could be through two or three versions, you know, massive versions of WordPress or a Drupal. Uh, you know, you just don't know, you don't have predictability there either. Uh, so with that, I'm going to open up. I see there's a couple of questions. Let me just get to them in a second. Bear with me. And there's a little microphone. So if you have any other questions, you know, send them in now. I have a couple. Um, do, do, do. Sharon, what are some decoupled CMSs that are available? So it's interesting. Again, the off-the-shelf platforms like uh, WordPress or Drupal are obviously trying to become decoupled with plugins. I would not call them native decoupled. Uh, the most interesting things I see right now in terms of decoupled, other than custom, which is what I sort of recommend doing, is building a more customized framework. 
there are some uh, SaaS companies right now, like Contentful, and they're offering a CMS platform that's actually hosted, similar to any other software as a service. You define what your data types are, and they make everything accessible through an API. And I think that's a very interesting model. There's another enterprise player doing that, and I forget right now who it is. So you have to excuse me on that, but I think you're going to see more and more companies doing that in the coming, uh, you know, the coming years. Uh, my my one hesitation with that would be I, I feel like that's more handcuffed than even off the shelf software because you're de you're dependent on someone else's business to be successful in the long term. So in terms of the proper way to do decouple to give you complete flexibility and ownership, I would say probably building one is the best way to do it. Um, if you went for a contentful and you know they're not successful, and, you know one day they give you 30 days notice if you're lucky and says hey the site's going down you're going to be in a real bad place. Uh, so you do have to, uh, you know, consider that. And I have one more here. I'm going to do Tim. Thoughts on hosting providers that maintain WordPress? Yeah. So there's a lot of them out there. Uh, I brought up WordPress VIP, which is ridiculously expensive. I, I don't know who's paying that much. Probably some of their super enterprise customers. It's funny. Automatic also, I believe, owns WP Engine, which is a decent environment. Um, WP Engine, I believe that they run the updates for you. They help you with a development versus live environment. Uh, it's, it's not a bad offering. It's not super expensive. I have had some issues with it. Uh, and I believe on the Drupal side, there's Pantheon. I think they're doing the same thing. Uh, you know, one of things you have to remember is that it's a good architecture that they have, but it is shared. So if a lot of traffic is coming in to another person within their network, there is a possibility that could take you down as well. And I think that's something to always be concerned about. Um, and another issue I had there, which is interesting, was they made their development environment for each site publicly accessible. So we had a client on WP Engine who had something like 5,000 pages, and their subdomain was crawled by Google the same time as the live domain, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. And this was a massive bug, which resulted in Google thinking that there were duplicate content issues and affected the SEO of the live site. And I was kind of surprised that a company like WP Engine wouldn't have a solution for that. And this was not years ago. This was recent. Like, we ran into this in the last couple of months. Um, so that might just be a specific problem to them. Uh, and again, there are hosting providers that take care of some of the updates for you. Um, you know, you could definitely give them a try. But always keep in mind, again, you know, WordPress really thinks the value of enterprise-level security and upkeep is starting at 5000 a month. So it's a pretty sizable sum. With that, I'm going to get going a little bit early. Our next webcast, I know it's going to be on the 28th of March, a month from today. I'm just not sure what the topic's going to be yet. Still working on it. So, uh, you know, it's going to be something, uh, something. Maybe, maybe we'll go back, talk about decoupled CMSs. Maybe we'll talk about a design development process. I have a couple of people with ideas. If you have suggestions, happy to take it. Uh, we'll probably know in the next couple of days, and we'll start emailing everybody, um, you know, so you could join us. And from there, uh, if you need anything else from us, you can always go to our blog, npgroup.net slash blog. I write at least one long form post a week. Uh, and if you have suggestions about a post this week, I could use a few. No. <laughs> uh, we have videos. We have some great stuff up there. I also put up all these webinars. And we have a bunch of eBooks that you should check out. Going to be working on an eBook just about security soon because uh, it's such an important topic. Uh, and if you do need to get catch us, again, it's npgroup.net. There's our phone number, 855-NP-GROUP. Always happy to hear from you. We're located just out of New York City. And, uh, and that's all I got today. So thanks for making it through with me. 45 minutes out of an hour. That's great. You have 15 free minutes. Go enjoy your day. And I will talk to you soon. Take care.